Hi guys, we're group two and we did our presentation on adult education and e-learning. The first thing I'm going to talk about is adults returning to school. And actually based on a 2009 report, it showed that 40% of college enrollment was by adults that were 25 and older. And that number is actually expected to rise to be around 45% by the time 2020 comes. And something interesting is that the rate adults are enrolling in college is actually going up faster than it is for traditional students. And just a couple key facts about that, one in three college students start after the age of 25 and one in five college students start after they turn 30. And 23% of people attending college actually have a family with children. Um, however though, 38% of adult college students end up dropping out after the first year, mostly due to financial reasons or academic reasons. Hi, I'd like to talk about some financial aspects of dropout students in e-learning. On average, the high school dropout can expect to learn about $20,000. This is $10,000 less than a high school graduate and $36,000 less than a college graduate. The unemployment rate for a high school dropout is about 12% in the United States. There are, there are many opportunities for high school diplomas to, re to be received online. Each state has their own requirements awarding diplomas. Um, another popular route for dropouts is trade school. Many kids go to trade school to receive hands-on skills with a combination of e-learning, and this is implement, implemented nationwide throughout trade schools. Every year, over 1.2 million drop out of high school in the United States. Over 25% freshmen fail to graduate on time. The United States' education program used to have higher standards, but now it's around 22nd out of 27th of developed countries. This is largely due to social reasons, course difficulty, safety, failing out, or students supporting and caring for other family members. So now I'm going to touch on a couple reasons that adults return to school. Uh, one of the big reasons is they're returning from a military deployment and at that point they're usually still at a pretty young age and they have a full military pension to support them. Uh, so going back to school usually isn't a problem and they can pursue a second career after that. And another reason is just straight up so they can start a new career. They might not be happy with the one that they're in now or they're looking for one that pays more money. And one of the main reasons I found when I was researching this was that a lot of people are forced into retirement earlier than they wanted to. 60% um, of people say that they were actually forced to retire earlier than they plan on doing it. And a lot of them need to return back to school so that they can get new skills uh, and have what it takes to be successful in the job environment right now. Um, and actually 52% of people that retire end up going back to school with usually about a two and a half year break between there. And also they return just to advance their current career, um, whether it means they'll get a promotion or just get paid more. Um, also, people go back to finish a previous education. Maybe they had to drop out earlier in their college career uh, for whatever a health reason, a financial reason, or just an academic reason. So they go back and finish their degree and it doesn't take as long because they already have credits from the last time they went back supporting that. Um, and with the online education advancements and opportunities that come with that, uh, more and more adults every year are actually continuing their education online even from their current workplace because of how convenient the online education is and that trend is expected to keep rising. Um, the last reason I have here is for job security. People uh, working want to place themselves to be more valuable than their coworkers are so that they can have a degree and just be worth more. So now we're going to talk about adult e-learning in Western countries. So America, Great Britain, and Canada are the top countries when it comes to e-learning. So some ways that they use e-learning to benefit working professionals are they're able to earn additional degrees, 
Um, they have the ability to study on their own schedule since they already have jobs, and there's no additional commuting that needs to be fit into their already busy schedules. So this means that professionals have easy access to gaining new knowledge about their field of work, and people who can't afford to attend a traditional university are able to um, earn a degree online. And including technology and distance learning allows for increased interaction between the teacher and students. And this means essentially that anyone with a device that can ac access the internet can earn some form of degree, whether it be the equivalent um, of a high school, which is a GED, or at a college education level. Speaking of Western countries, I want to start with the um, GEDs in the United States. For decades, the GED exam has been widely known as providing a path to high school equivalency credentials for people who do not earn a traditional high school diploma and need a second chance in order to get a job. These new tests are now administered only on computers and cost $120 per test. This requires a credit card on file. It is important to note that these people that are going back for their GEDs are trying to get new jobs. They might not have the money to open a credit card. Therefore, it is impossible to take the test without this credit card. There are a few testing sites too. You need transportation to and from the site, and if you don't have any way of transportation, then you cannot get there to take the test. Lyft, a Texas-based literacy organization, has observed a pattern of decreasing test scores. The number of adult learners in their program also claim that the test is too hard, since only 21 people passed in 2013 and a drop to two people passing in 2014. So now we're going to talk about adult e-learning in developing countries. And there are many benefits to implementing e-learning in underdeveloped countries. Some of them are there's no classrooms or physical textbooks, which means that uh, it's much less expensive. And cutting out the distance between home and school in countries where tra transportation is not feasible is very important. And people who want an education but do not have to risk losing their jobs in order to study since they can learn on their own terms. And a more educated workforce means more competitive economies on a world scale. So one example of this is in Africa, and Africa is expected to have a 15% annual growth in the next four years, and the African Virtual University has 29 different virtual learning centers that allow African students to connect to different universities around the world. Um, they contain forms of technology like computers and projectors, computers and projectors as shown in the photo, and this allows students to learn as if they are in real classrooms in a top university. Um, they also offer the opportunity to learn material that is being taught in other parts of the world that is not um, readily available in their country. The AVU is working towards making more use of mobile and multimedia technologies to make e-learning even more accessible, and studies have been done that show that mobile technologies like cell phones are the most effective ways to successfully educate students um, learning virtually in third world countries. Many students in these um, developing nations don't even finish primary school. And since many of them don't finish primary school, the ones that do go on to secondary, there aren't that many that do finish it either. In Sub-Sahara -Sub Africa, they only see about 42% of the students, no, they see about 42% of the students leaving school early, and then 33% of Southern and Western Asian students drop out too. Of the 121 million students currently out of primary and secondary school worldwide, more than 60% of them live in these developing nations. And with these developing nations, they tend to have a high rate of um, people not being able to read because they don't go to school. <laughs> Most countries only have one GED testing center available to use. China actually doesn't have any testing centers. The limited amount of testing centers making it very expensive and inconvenient to travel to. This means you also have to find um, transportation methods to and from these learning sites in all the other countries, not only just the United States. The price of GEDs is also super expensive. According to GED testing services, the price in the United States is $30 for each test, or $120 for all four subjects, and includes the GED test, same-day scoring, personalized score reports, two free retakes per subject, a transcript, and a diploma. The price in Canada is $40 for each test and $200 for all five. In other countries, it is $75 for each test and $300 for all four tests. It, all, it includes the GED test, same-day scoring, a personalized score report, and transcript and diploma. Notice that there's no free retakes for all other countries other than the United States. 
This makes it very expensive for all the other countries to try to retake these tests. Okay, and then lastly, these are just some graduation rates between like different levels of development nation, develop, developed nations. Um, so like Argentina and Colombia are about middle level development, and Argentina has about 50% of their students graduate, and Colombia has about 60%. In a nation like Somalia, there's about only 26% of their students that graduate, which is about a quarter of them. In the United States, about 75% of them graduate, and in Portugal, about 96 And then in a country like India, only 33% of these students graduate. So in developing nations, even if they do have technology, their rates of their graduation levels are a lot lower than in the United States. Oh, this is our work slated. <laughs>